Um, so, um, once again, there are knots, and remember, the past two days I used representations of knots either by diagrams, so okay, knot was represented by diagram D, or a grid G, which is secretly also a diagram of the knot, but it's a very specific one. And today I will introduce a third way of presenting knot. So um, consider the following five topo. A genus G surface, closed, oriented, nice, smooth surface, together with <coughs> two sets of curves on the surface, which I will call alpha up to alpha one up to alpha g, and beta one up to beta g. So these are simple closed curves on the surface. The alphas are disjoint among themselves, the betas are disjoint, but the way they intersect, this will be our main concern, together with two points, which I will denote by z and w, and they have to satisfy a few very simple rules, such that uh, sigma minus the union of the alphas is connected. Sigma minus the union of the betas is connected. And then Z and W are distinct, and they are all disjoint from the alphas and the betas. So Z is not equal to W, and both are in sigma minus the union of the alphas, union, the union of the betas. So, I claim that this, this is an input which defines me a three manifold together with the knot. So, uh, such a five tuple, sigma and then the vector alpha will be denoted by this underlined alpha. So, this five tuple gives rise to a three manifold together with the knot. How, how do we do that? Well, let's take sigma and multiply it with the interval minus one one. So we promote the two-dimensional sigma to a three-dimensional manifold, and I will draw it in sort of a funny way. I will sort of bend it over. So this is my picture for sigma cross the interval. So uh, this is sigma cross one, this is sigma cross minus one, and there is in the middle, there is somewhere sigma cross zero. And so what I will do is I will draw the betas here, the alphas there, and then I will draw the, the knot somewhere, oh, sorry, the, the two points. So of course, I will try to do some simple examples. So we have a genus three surface, we are needing three beta curves. We need three alphas. Visible. It's supposed to be pink. Okay, and then we have the two dots. So we have Z cross 1, and then we have W cross 1 somewhere. And likewise here, so it should be W is here and Z is somewhere there. Okay, and now I give the construction. So the way you construct a three manifold is very simple. You just take a three-dimensional two-handle and you attach along all the betas and you attach along all the alphas. So a three-dimensional two-handle looks like a, an upside-down breakfast bowl. And then you just attach it here. By this condition, if you do these attachments along these three curves, what you will get is a cobordism to S2. And similarly here. So we almost have a three manifold. We just use the three this to just finish it off. So I add on the top B3. And that will be my Y. And we should see the knot as well. So I sort of connect trivially the two Z's, Z cross one and Z cross minus one by the interval, likewise the W's. And finally, I finish it to be a knot by connecting Z to W in this surface by avoiding the, B, the, the blue curves. I can always do that because the complement of the blue curves is connected, so I have two points. I can connect them, 
And so I would make an attempt to do that. Something like that. And likewise here, I just go out and connect the, the, the W and the C. So that's my K. So I don't know how convincing this is. Every such five tuple satisfying these conditions uniquely specifies a three manifold together with the multiple. So it is a little theorem, which is a simple consequence of basic Morse theory that every Y K, every pair of a three manifold together with a knot arises in this way. And this presentation is unique up to certain moves. I will call them Hagard moves. And I will not really describe them. I will just say one sentence. So you can, of course, isotope the curves, move them around a little bit to keep the condition that they don't intersect each other and they don't intersect each other. So these are isotopies. You can apply handle slides. Clearly, if you slide one handle over the other one, it will not change the theme anymore. If you do it in a way that it doesn't interfere with the two points, it doesn't change the knot either. So we can apply handle slides. And finally, we can change the the genus of the curve, we can apply stabilization. You just add, you just connect some, this, this uh, the configuration with T2, with two curves which intersect each other in one point. So stabilization, destabilization. And so the philosophy is again the same. We would like, yes? Could you say again uh, the two handles, how many are added? And so it's a genus G surface. And you have G curves, right? Exactly as many as many genus you have, and you just attach the handles along the these curves. So so G two handles. So G two handles along the beta and G two handles along the alpha. So it's two G two handles, and I just sort of tortured this picture of sigma cross interval. If you don't torture it, then somehow you attach two handles on the top and one handles on the bottom. Um, zero handles in the bottom? Zero handles in the bottom or one handle in the bottom? So you have C across the interval and you don't do this twist, then you just add two handles and on the top you have a three handle and in the bottom you attach one handle and a single zero handle. And luckily that you have an equal number of two handles and one handle, so the other characteristic will be zero as it is supposed to be. Um, okay, so the philosophy is the same. This is our input, and we would like to get some kind of a construction of a homology group or, or whatever invariant, and we would like to see that whatever we constructed doesn't change under isotopies, handle slides, and stabilizations. So in this way, we actually get an invariant of the pair rather than the five of them. And I will not go into the, the invariance proof, but I will tell you what the definition of the, of the chain complex is. It will be a slightly more general than what we discussed up to now. The first step is to make things more complicated, and I'm sorry for that. So we have the five couple. This is a very nice, truly low dimensional object. It's like a surface together with two sets of curves, and now we turn into high dimensions, and we take the, the g fold symmetric power of sigma, and I should remind you that somehow symmetric powers are genuinely complicated spaces. If you take a manifold and you take its symmetric power, typically it's a stratified space, it's not a manifold. With one notable example, uh, exception, when the manifold is of dimension two, so of complex dimension one, then by a miracle, going by the name of the fundamental theorem of algebra, the symmetric power will be also a manifold. So this is a real 2G-dimensional two complex G-dimensional manifold. And we take the product of the alpha i's, which I will denote by T alpha, since this will be a torus. And this is why we take the symmetric power rather than the Cartesian power product. 
because we don't have an order of the alphas, right? These are just attaching circles, and there is no good reason to say this is my first, second, and third. Likewise, I take uh, the product of the betas, and this is my t beta, and I associate a divisor to z and a divisor to, to w, a codimension to some manifold, namely I take z cross the one less symmetric power, and likewise for w. This is just to say that vz is the collection of those elements in the symmetric power which contain, at least in one slot, my preferred point z. Can you remind us what the symmetric power is? Oh, so this is just, you take the Cartesian product and then you mod out the, the, the action of the symmetric group. So instead of taking uh, n tuples, you take collections of n points as sets and you allow multiplicity. That's the problem actually. This is why these spaces are complicated. But so we have this nice smooth manifold, two nice uh, smooth submanifolds which topologically look very nice. These are just tori and two divisors for dimension two sub um, A little uh, remark, I did allow the alphas and the betas to intersect, and by generic position, I can always assume that they, that they intersect generically, so uh, transversely. And so if we impose that condition that they are transverse to each other, then it's not very hard to see that these two guys will intersect transversely. Remember, this is real 2G dimensional, this is real G, real G, so the expectation is that they will intersect in a, in a zero dimensional manifold. Sigma is compact, so the symmetric power is compact, so they will intersect in finite manifolds. So I will sort of try to give you a schematic picture, but it is very schematic. We are talking about high dimensional manifolds, and this will be symbolized by this potato. And um, so there is this T alpha, beta, and now comes the problem that I have these two co-dimensions, two sub manifolds so this will look like this, somehow. This is Vz, and there is a Vw somewhere, okay? They will, they will not intersect, so these two co-dimensions, two sub manifolds will not intersect T alpha and T beta because of this condition. <coughs> Okay, and now I associate to this gadget, this five tuple, I associate a sort of complicated algebraic object. It will be a free module over a particular ring admitting two filtrations. So that's the plan. So um, consider the ring of Laurent polynomials, where again the coefficient for simplicity is from the field of two elements but it can be any other ring, like the integers, but I will always say that. And the free, free module over it generated by T alpha intersection T beta. So I will call it CFK infinity. Um, so let's, let's denote this by script A. H. This is like the Hagar data. So this is just the sum of F U U inverse X, where X runs through this finite set T of intersection T. So this is my, my module, and I would like to equip this module with the various structures, and I will be a little bit sloppy about it. Um, so the first structure I would like to define is uh, boundary operator, as always. And this is where the real problem arises. This is where we have to use sort of complicated analysis. And I will rather draw. So uh, of course, this is a free module. So I, for a module and the morphism, I only have to specify it on the basis. And it will look like this. So let me just write down, and then I will spend a little time explaining it. Um, so I'm, I'm summing for all the other intersection points. And I have to explain what this, uh, what this coefficient is. U is the, the variable. 
phi is just a homotopy class of maps from the disk D2 into the symmetric power such that, so let me just draw, this is minus pi i, this is the, the uh, negative real and this is the positive real part complex numbers with unit length. And so the map goes into that previous picture. So this is T alpha, this is T beta. In a way, so we pick two intersection points, right? X and Y, and I have to tell you what this gadget means. We are taking those maps where I goes to X, minus I goes to Y, this side of the circle goes to T alpha, and this side goes to T beta. So this is a sort of a complicated way to describe that I'm considering a Whitney disk here. Right? So I should remind you that this looks like a line, but this is a genus G, uh, a G-dimensional torus, and this is another G-dimensional torus, so there is no unique way to go from X to Y, but it doesn't matter. We just take one sort of part from X to Y, here, there, and fill it with it. Okay. So phi is the homotopy class of such disks, one fixed homotopy class, and uh, uh, VW meant uh, intersection phi is just the intersection number of these, of these two objects. This is a relative homology class relative to the T alphas and the T betas. VW and VZ are absolute homologies in the symmetric power, so that intersection number makes sense. of any representative of phi with VW. Of course, I assume that they intersect sort of transversely. Notice that this is called dimension two. This is dimension two, so they will intersect in a few points. And then there is a little bit of an issue of orientation, but everything is complex, so this is sort of taken care of. So this will give you a number there, so that's fine. And then what remains is the really hard part, what is this? And so I will just say a few words about that. You just take M phi to be the space of holomorphic representatives of phi. So this is a homotopy class of maps from the disk to the space, and some maps might be holomorphic, some are only C infinity, and we just collect all the holomorphic ones. Of course, it's easier to say than to, to actually understand what this space is. First of all, in order this to make sense, we have to pick a, a complex structure on, the, on this manifold. It can be done since sigma is a two-dimensional surface, so it is a Riemann curve. It does admit a complex structure, and if you use that complex structure, the symmetric power comes with a complex structure. And then this makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, this space is not exactly what I wrote there. There is a little head because notice if you have one such holomorphic map, you have immediately R many. Because from our previous studies in complex analysis, we learned that there are maps from the disk to itself which keep I and minus I fixed. Indeed, you just prescribe three points on the disk and the other three points, and if the angles are fine, then you can map one to the other. So there are these translations, angle-preserving translations, exactly on them. If you are not happy with that picture, you should remember that once you skip i and minus i, this object is just uh, uh, biholomorphic to an infinite strip, and there is this translation, the time translation up or down, so whenever you have one such map, you have exactly, you have immediately R many. And you would like to portion out by that direction. And this is this map, and this is this space, and we would like to compute the, the number of points we have here. So we only consider those phi's for which the dimension of, of this space is one. So after you portion it out, you have a zero dimensional space and you compute the, the elements in that space. Once again, it's easy to say, but there are a lot of issues you have to face. So first of all, why would that be a manifold? Typically, it's not a manifold. And it turns out that if you allow yourself 
not to take a complex structure here, but an almost complex structure. In fact, even more complicatedly, a whole path of almost complex structures. And you use it wisely. This will be a manifold. The dimension can be computed by the Arthur Singer index theorem. And, <coughs> and the quotient will be a manifold. And we only take those which are of zero dimension. And then we take the, the number of points. In order to do that, we also need to know that this is a complex zero dimensional manifold. And this is where the story of Grom of compactness comes in, which tells us that, at least in this case, the space will be compact, the portion space. So this is the definition. Everything is very simple, like how you come up for a particular knot with all these uh, nice presentations, how to compute how many section points you have. That's everything topological. But this last step is pretty challenging. And in general, it's like not really possible to do. So we will just sort of go around. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can you repeat why? How do we know they bond at this? This. Oh, sometimes they don't. So then, then this will be an empty space, right? So, so for some x and y, there is no such disk. Then we should be very happy because we can <laughs> we can handle it with topology on it. It's the empty set. It's nice, and we are happy. Don't have your hopes very high. <laughs> um, okay, so we have this gives us an endomorphism, a module endomorphism. So we have a chain, we have a, a, a module with an endomorphism, and the fact is that it's a, it's a chain complex. It requires a proof, and I will not do that. And also, it admits two filtrations. So, um, fact. Uh, CFK infinity uh, of age delta is a chain complex over FUU inverse admitting two filtrations and the gradient. So I will not really describe what these gradings and filtrations are. I will just sort of remind you that in our previous examples, there was this number m we associated to the Kaufman states, which were the generators of the corresponding module. There is a very similar way to associate numbers to these intersection points. Uh, that will be the grade, that will be the m grading. The two filtrations are coming from a very similar construction of constructing a number A for every such intersection point. And plus, so far I always pushed to have the base ring to be FU, and now I switch to U, U inverse. The difference is not big, except if you remember the polynomial ring can be generated by one single element, as opposed to this Noram polynomial ring where you, know, you sort of don't know where to start. It's like a, a a rank one module over that ring is like, like an affine line. There is no obvious starting point. A filtration will sort of pick that. And we, this comes very naturally because we do have a basis of the module. So somehow this is the what's called the J filtration, which is just taking an element, it just counts what is the power of the U in front of the of, in front of the natural generators. So we have a bifiltered graded chain complex over that ring, and that's already ready. So it sounds a little scary, and it is a little scary, but it's not that bad. So I would like to show you how to picture such an object. Um, but before doing that, let me just state a theorem. So the first is that the total homology of CFK infinity in the boundary is just F U U inverse. So the total homology is not so exciting. But remember, we have these two filtrations, and maybe using those filtrations, we will get something interesting. Um, and the next is that. Uh, Suppose uh, C1 and C2 corresponds 
to um, y1, k1, and y2, k2, which are the filmorphic. Then C1 and C2 are bifiltered graded chain homotopy equivalent. Okay, so um, they are not exactly the same. You don't find an isomorphism. Remember that once somebody gives you y, y1, k1, you have to come up with this five tuple, and this is not unique. It's unique only up to these choices. And then when you create this chain complex, you still have to pick something else, like a complex structure. And there are various choices. And the theorem just tells you that no matter what choices you do, you might get two different chain complexes, but they are actually very closely related. From the homological algebra point of view, they are the same. They are not isomorphic, unfortunately. That would be just too much to expect. But they are very close to each other. They are chain homotopy equivalent using a chain homotopy which respects all the extra structures. And uh, so let me just sort of state it for, uh, for knots in S3. If K1 and K2 are uh, concordant knots <coughs> in S3, then there is a nice relation between the two chain complexes. Then C K1 plus K1 is filtered chain homotopy equivalent to C K2 plus A2, where A1, A2 are acyclic. So the total homology is just here. So somehow I abandoned this concordance equivalence for, for long, but now it just comes back. If you have two knots, you can create a corresponding chain complex. And they will not be isomorphic. We cannot expect them. They will not even be uh, chain homotopy equivalent because the two knots are not isotopic, only concordant, but stably they are. Right? You add something which doesn't have a homology, and you have something else which still doesn't have a homology, and they will become filtered, bifiltered, graded chain homotopy So this guy is also bifiltered and graded. This is also bifiltered and graded. But when you take the homology, you completely forget about the filtration. Okay? So this is a theorem of general. And it makes life very convenient, as hopefully you will see. So this is a sort of slightly confusing structure. Let me just show you how to picture it. <coughs> um, so um, remember that we have these generators, which generate the chain complex. And each generator comes with a vibrating. The, the J value will be 0, and they will have some kind of an A value. And in addition to that, they have the M, which will be somehow not uh, pictured this time. So I just set up a coordinate system on the plane where I measure J on that axis and A on this one. And I will put a dot for every generator on the level of A. So if this particular X has, say, AX equals 3, then I put a dot on that spot. And I do it for every generator, so I will get a picture of like having dots all over the place. Then, as the, the, uh, the definition says, in order to picture all the generators of this as an F module, I have to sort of translate every X by F U U inverse. And I will do it in a way that U will bring me one down and to the left, and U inverse is just the inverse. So Ux will be here, U square of x, U cube, and so on. So I will have a pattern of, along that line, and I repeat it infinitely many times by sliding down and also by up. And then I have to remember what the boundary map is, so I will just take x 
and I compute this boundary, it will tell me what are the y's appearing in the boundary and what is the coefficient. This is a this is a number. This is zero or one, and this is a u power. So x will have say this is y, this is u y, and if u y appears in the boundary of x, I will put an error there. And then I do it for every dot. It will take a while, and then I will get a very confusing but still manageable. Does that make sense? Why is it only 0 or 1? Well, we work over f. Oh, f is, is, f is field always the elements. field of two elements. Ah. Uh, and again, the usual remark applies. You can do orientation, and you can do it over c and over any field you like. And I don't like any other fields. So. <laughs> <laughs> and again, somehow, you never gain anything. That's sort of, it's not a theorem. It's a, it's a, a fact of life that so far we never saw anything more from Z than from Z. Um, okay, so we have this picture. Let me just give you one example for the trefoil knot, for the right-handed trefoil. You have three generators and the boundary map looks like this. So this is what you have to repeat infinitely many times. Okay, it goes up and down. From this picture, you can recover everything what we learned so far. For example, if we take the, only the left-hand side and only the horizontal arrows, this will give us HFK minus or GH minus, as I put uh, for the grid. We can have HFK hat. Everything can be recovered only by simple algebraic manipulations. But how do we get? invariance of concordance classes, how do we get some sensible numbers out of this picture? And that's what I would like to do now. So here's an idea. So you have this picture, and uh, so um, consider HT to be the half plane in the plane given by the equation of inequality y less than t over t minus 2x. This sounds a little weird, and it is weird, but uh, it's a very, na very nice parameterization of these, these lines. So this just says that we take a line which is sort of skew and goes through the origin. And we consider the half plane here. Okay? We can do that. <coughs> If we do that, we can specify a sub-complex of my original complex by considering only those elements for which the corresponding dot falls into that half plane. So consider H, a C, H, T generated by those axes for which J, X, A, X is in H, T. Okay? So I can do it for every t. Notice that in order to get a, a gadget which is closed under boundaries, since the boundary goes always to the left or down, we have to have this, uh, uh, or, or region in the plane should be closed under taking this southwestern region starting from the plane. So that's a subcomplex. And this is a submodule if we consider, if we regard CFK infinity as an FU model. Of course, multiplication by U inverse will take you out of that subspace, so we, are, we don't want to allow that. But we take these submodules, and then uh, I should define one more thing, HTS is by definition those pairs for which x minus s, y minus s is in HT. So HTS is sort of an, an S translate of this of this guy, either up or down depending on the sign of s. Is that okay? So this is what we do. And then um, We consider the following function, so uh, definition. Oops. 
epsilon of k at t should be the infimum of those S's for which the inclusion, the, the map induced on homology by the inclusion on C H T S to C F K infinity is onto. So I should remind you that the total homology is just F U U inverse. So in one grading, this is just a, a one dimensional vector space of two elements. So what this requires is that somehow we take the infimum of those S's for which this guy, this translated half plane, will hit the generator of that homology. So that's, that will be a number, this is a real number. And in this way we get a, a, a function which has the following properties. So epsilon of k is a continuous piecewise linear function on 0, 2. It is a concordance invariant which follows easily from the theorem of, of Jan Hong because somehow what really matters on this side is the homology of the chain complex, but it doesn't change if you add an acyclic factor. So the, the picture for this one is the same as the picture for that one, and likewise here, so it's, an, it's, an, it's a concordism invariant. And uh, indeed, epsilon gives you a homomorphism from the concordance classes of knots into the set of continuous functions uh, 0, 2, well, the image will be only piecewise inner functions. And so, for example, uh, the first breaking point for the torus knot 2 n n plus 1 is at 2 over n. So we get a bunch of functions, a function for every k. And we can compute them for many knots, including torus knots. And these are continuous and piecewise linear, so that is sort of a first breaking point. And it turns out that this is sort of a sensitive information. For example, for these n, n plus 1 torus knots, it happens at 2n. OK, so, that's, so why, are, why, are, why am I so happy about that? Let me add one more line here. If k is alternating, then the function is very simple. It will look like we'll have two linear pieces broken at one, and the height is dictated by the signature. You should get used to that somehow. For alternating knots, we don't get anything beyond the uh, Alexander polynomial and the signature. So, um, so let me name one corollary, and then I will try to work out a few examples. So, corollary T and n plus 1, this set of knots, when n goes from 2 to infinity, is a set, is a linearly independent set in C. So, from that observation, it immediately follows, since if you have a linear uh, relation among these guys, so uh, sum of ni, sum of uh, ki, t ni, ni plus 1 is congruent to, to, to the trivial knot for which the, the invariant is, of course, the constant 0 function, then the, the, same, linear, uh, the same linear combination of their epsilon functions should be equal to 0. But, you just take the largest possible ni appearing here, and at that point, you will have a break, so it cannot be the constant function. So somehow it makes these concordance questions um, very simple. Let me do a few computations. So uh, I prepared the um, 
and I, I also drew a few diagrams, so you can just test it around. Yeah, there are two, two sheets. Two sheets. The first sheet is two-sided, the second sheet is one-sided, so get one of each. Okay. Uh, so, um, so as I try to convince you to come up with a sigma with this five couple is not that difficult. In fact, one can do it from a projection. The real difficult part is to understand this boundary map. And I would like to show you examples where you can actually identify the boundary map and show us the uh, examples. And uh, my <coughs> motivating lemma or proposition <coughs> will be to show that t the torus knot 2p, where p is a prime, is a literally independent set. Okay. My diagrams will look like T2, a single alpha, a single beta, and two points. Okay, so here's the first uh, example, of course, as you always do, you start with the trefoil. You can see it up there. The trefoil is a torus knot, it can be drawn on the torus. And so I claim that this torus, together with the blue and the red, the red is the alpha, the blue is the beta, and the two points actually give you the trefoil. You know, drawing on the torus is sort of hard, so we will follow this convention to represent the torus by this fundamental domain, this square, where the two sides are identified, the two sides, and then the top and the bottom are also identified. And so this is what you get. The three points, x1, x2, and x3, are shorthanded by 1, 2, and 3. And these two pictures are the same. I just use a different identification. There is a shear between the two sides. The top and the bottom is still identified naturally. And um, yes. OK. To convince you that this is really the, the, uh, uh, the trefoil knot, I, I drew the, the lines connecting by, by green. I go from this point and this joint from the blue, but intersecting the red. And then you get sort of a full turn. And then I intersect the blue, but this joint from the red. And this is the brown one going around. And then I will leave you for your imagination that this is really the graph foil. But in this picture, it's sort of more visible. And this immediately shows that whatever this knot is, it can be drawn without intersections on the torus. So it should be a torus knot. And then there are not that many torus knots. And you see that it intersects the red curve in three points, so, or, or two points, so it's like two something, and, and it's really the trefoil. Uh, here is my, my other family of torus knots, the two, two, and plus one, for which this is a subfamily, and they have a very similar picture. Uh, you see, it had a, a, a straight line and one such rainbow, and for the two, two, and plus one, you still have a straight line, and the number of rainbows, exactly n rainbows. So these are our main concerns. Um, now let me talk a little bit about this uh, boundary map. So remember, we are looking for maps from D2 to the symmetric power of sigma. But now sigma is the force. It's of genus 1. So we are looking at maps from D2 to the first symmetric power of the force, which is just the force itself. So that's somehow a little bit more feasible. 
We are trying to understand holomorphic maps from when we, understand, when we want to understand the space, we would like to understand holomorphic maps from the torus, from the disk to the torus with these bounding conditions. So we can sort of understand immediately the um, x1 up to x, in this case 2n plus 1, this set of generators is just a set of intersections of alpha and beta. In the picture, it's just this, the intersection of the red and the blue. There are exactly two n plus one many. And such a map, remember, the, one, the top should go to x, the bottom should go to y, and this one should go to the red, and this one to the blue. So what you are looking for is sort of bygones where the one side is red, the other one is blue, and it connects your two favorite points. So for example, there is a, such a map from 1 to 2n. You see the bygone, you just go on the blue and come back on the red. There is another one which goes from, uh, so this one, sorry, this one goes from 2n to 1, and this one goes from n plus 1 to n minus 1. Do you see that? It's sort of, of course, now the bygone is sort of turned, and we keep all orientation convention as I wrote down there. So here, sort of from top to bottom, and on the other side is from bottom to top. And you have a lot of these, uh, holomorph uh, these, these maps, and then you invoke the Riemann mapping theorem, saying that all these guys have holomorphic representatives, and if you mod out by this R action I was alluding to, then this map is actually so Riemann, you know, that's a good theorem. I didn't appreciate that when I studied. Now, okay, so we would like to do the computation. And so here is the chain complex for, for the trefoil. So you have three generators, and you see that from two, you can go down to one on the left, and you can go up to three on the right. So these two arrows sort of indicate that I go from x2 to x1 and x3. And I also record how many times this disk passes through Z and W. You remember, now Z and W are VZ and VW themselves, because they should be multiplied by the zeroth symmetric power. <coughs> and so if you work out what I said there, then this is the picture you get from that simple diagram. And that's enough to compute whatever you want. So for example, I wrote down what is HFK hat and HFK minus. And what is this uh, PK polynomial? And there is a parenthesis missing. And what is GK? So this is what we described uh, or defined earlier on. Of course, I mean, you know, in knot theory, if you can do something for the trefoil, I mean, everybody knows the trefoil, so that's not good enough. So let's see whether we can do a little better for the for these uh, T two and uh, two two n plus one. Well, now you have two n plus one generators. And you have more of these disks, so there are n of them coming down, n of them going up. And so I just sort of collected them, and this is the picture you will get. And uh, going to the presentation on the plane, you get that picture. Of course, this is not the entire picture. You have to sort of shift by, by integers to the left and to the right. And just to make it a little clearer, I didn't add those. those uh, extra repeated patterns. Once again, this is enough to compute whatever you want. And for example, if you compute HFK minus, this is what you get. Um, OK. So um, well, now we go to this epsilon computation. So what do you want to do? You just take a, a skew line has the origin, and you would like to move it up until it hits the generator of the total homology. I indicated by red, the generator of the total homology, there are two guys, and they become homologous, but since they are both, their sum is the boundary of that guy. So it will be really a one-dimensional one. If you take a line which, for which the slope is between 0 and minus 1, then you will hit this lower red circle first. So this is where you have to stop. This is where this inf, which I already erased, starts to work, and that will be your epsilon value. When you have a slope minus 1, then you keep the two dots at the same time. 
and when you go below minus one, then you will hit this guy first. So somehow, for a while, from zero to minus one, you will always hit this first. This will be a linear growth. And then you will measure it when do you hit this guy first. So this will be another linear growth. And this is why the, the function will look like this. So until one, it will follow what happens with that dot. And then it switches to the other one. Does that make sense? So you will get this tent shaped thing. Uh, what happens for the 2, 2 n plus 1 naught? Well, in this case, you have more generators of the, uh, of the, of the total homology. They are all homologous, but there are more dots. But the principle will be the same again. You take this Q line, and if it is between minus 1 and 0, you will hit this guy first. And you measure that. At minus 1, you will hit all the points at the same time. And then you will see what happens when, and then you will hit the, the other guy first. So somehow it will be still like a pen. It will be one, it will have one break. So that sounds very simple, and it is very simple. But of course there are more complicated knots. I just pick one, which is the three four torus knot. And um, so this is three four. You get, you get four strands and you apply three twists, and then you close this braid. It's a little more complicated. This is the Alexander polynomial. This is the picture of the 3, 4 torus knot. You have to take it for granted, but I checked at home. I just drew it for many hours. And then, again, it gets a much nicer picture when you apply a shear. And then you have these rainbows and guys cutting across. And we do the computation for this one. It's a little more complicated, and so, for example, you, you, you should see the map from x4 to x3. There is this bygone, which goes from 4 to 3. And there is another one, which goes from 5 to 1. The bygone is unfortunately cut into two pieces. There is a half bygone on the top and a half bygone in the bottom. But you have to remember that everything is glued to a torus. But there are more bygones. For example, you can go from 2 to 5 when you are not taking one fundamental domain, but four. You remember, we are talking about maps from D2 to T2. They can always be lifted to C, because this is simply connected. And that's the picture what we really have to see, like how many bygones we do have on C. Now, I never said that this map should be an embedding in any sense. So that, that big bygone from 5 to 2 in the torus, it sort of wraps around and it bites itself from the back. And it can happen, you know, you, you might need to go around many times, that's okay. In 3-4, there is one such wrapping around, and another one here. Um, if you write out, you know, the five generators and the whole picture what I alluded to here, this is what you get. And now I indicated by the red dots the generators of the homology. And again, you play the same game of taking a skew line and see when do you hit the first red one, and for a while you will hit always this guy. Then you switch to that one, and then you switch to this. So somehow, how convex the, the red points are from this perspective will decide how many breaking points you will have. In this case, you will have three breaking points, and indeed, the function will look like this. And the breaking is at 2 third and 4 third. So you can come up with all kinds of computations along the same line. And uh, um, I computed, again, the, the hat and the minus. And you have it in, in the printout, I hope. And uh, here is a do-it-yourself exercise. If you are uh, entertained by this, these little exercises, this is the, uh, the twist knot. You just take a <coughs> Two strands, couple of twists, and then you finish off like this. <coughs> and you can sort of derive the same kind of calculations, and it's sort of very simple. But the natural question is like, what class of knots can be handled so easily? When do you have a Hagar diagram on the torus? And unfortunately, not every knot that such a diagram, this class of knots are called the 1-1 knots, and uh, all torus knots are like that, 
or twist knots, actually, or two bridge knots. There are a lot of examples and complicated examples, but it's not the whole knot theory by far. And uh, I think I should stop here. And although I promised this theorem, let me say two sentences about that. So in this case, what happens is that somehow the, the epsilon function doesn't contain enough information. These are those type of knots I encountered here. And they have this 10 shape. And you have no idea what happens when you take linear combinations. And the idea of handling these guys is a little bit more complicated. What you do is you take the double branch cover of the knots. So you end up in a length space, having a knot in the length space. You generalize this whole theory for knots in rational homology spheres. And for, you know, the sad news is that the epsilon functions will be still these 10 plus. But there will be more than one. You have many species structures. And it turns out that they will have this very nice shape of uh, having smaller and smaller tens, depending on the spin C structure. And this will help you to show that you can get, whenever you have a linear combination, you will get a contradiction by applying it to various different spin C structures. So there is a way out. And so the, the lesson from that is that you frequently hear that the whole theory doesn't say anything about automating knots. Well, not on the note. You have to go to a cover, or you have to do some kind of a topological trick. And the, the theory is somehow you know, quite smart. I mean, you know, in this case, you have very little information, but you have a lot of them. And then it's like a puzzle. You know, when you're in a puzzle, you have very little information, but if you put them nicely together, you get interesting stuff. So whenever you see an alternating knot, don't give up hope. You know, there is something. So um, this is what I wanted to tell you about this story. And I would like to thank again Gerard and Nate for, for inviting me and for having uh, me for these few very nice days. Thank you. understanding what holomorphic maps are. So then you have a high dimensional complex analysis problem, so you don't like it. Well, in a new uh, approach, uh, Oswald and Sabo initiated a program where they actually tried to develop a boundary map, which gives you maybe another chain complex, but chain homotopy equivalent to that, where the boundary map can be computed using some algebra. The algebra is quite sophisticated relies on the border fluid homology package, so you need to do like uh, consider A infinity algebra and A infinity modules. And the, the idea is very simple. You have the knot projection and you sort of slice it up. And in every slice you either have a minimum, a maximum, or a crossing. And you just have to define algebras for the slices, by modules for these guys, and then a tensor product structure. And they just, you know, you can just sit down and define. And you can define whatever you want. Of course, you would like to have something which gives you an invariant. So that's the, that's the CW homology in not fair homology, I think. You know, because there is the grid is like simplicial homology in usual topology. It's very nice. You can explain it in a few minutes. But it's so, it needs so many generators. The holomorphic theory is like singular homology. It's like. It's easy to show why it's an invariant, but you cannot actually compute it. I mean, usually when we teach topology, we compute it for the one point in space, right? That's what we do. And here I do it for the trefoil. The trefoil is like the one point in space of not theory. And this is sort of the intermediate one. So maybe this will be the final answer. And then what's next? I don't know. I mean, you know, there is this group, C. 
What is it? And we know that it contains z infinities. I just gave you two. But these guys span as infinity sum, and these guys span as infinity sum. You immediately see that this one should be linearly dependent of all these because these are alternating. They have one breaking point. It has two. So you get this is a typical theorem in, in concordance group theory that I specify a subgroup and then I prove that it contains an infinite degenerated free group. And you name the subgroup and there is an infinite inside. But we still don't know. Does it have torsion? Does it contain Q? All these maps, what we define, are homomorphisms to Z. And that's very unconvenient. A homomorphism to Z will have any torsion in the kernel and any Q in the kernel. So you have two torsions. You have two torsions, the uh, figure eight, and you have infinitely many such nodes, but no other torsion. Sorry. Um, you know, the next step would be to, to give trickier homomorphisms. And in fact, there are some steps where you have only maps, not homomorphisms. And you have a hope but, you know, whether these hopes will work out and those maps will really detect something new, you don't know. Any other questions? Yes. Um, is there a name for the minimum number of genes <coughs> of that uh, five tuple? Like for a nut, uh, what is the how we can give a name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for a three manifold, it's the Higar genus. Right? Okay. So every three manifold can be given by a four tuple. But actually, three, you don't even need that one. This will tell you a three manifold, and the genus of the surface is the Higar genus of the of the uh, of the Higar splitting. Um, so you know, there is a there is a concept of G n naught, where you have a Hagar splitting such that the knot can be represented by a genus G Hagar splitting of, of n such unknotted arcs. And you are asking, you know, every knot can be represented as G1, and is there a name for G? I don't know. I mean, Hagar. Hagar knot, something like that. <laughs> Definitely, when this is one, then the knots are called one one knots, and this is what uh, what I was considering here because they are the boundary maps. Okay. Um, so time later for some more questions. Um, all right, we're very glad that you were able to come. Um, let's give them a very special. Time.